Last weekend, I picked up my nephews and spent the weekend with them. I always want to encourage them to be able to talk to me. So when we're in the car together, I usually have an audiobook or a podcast on low. And yeah, I am that auntie where I'm always wanting them to absorb educational things around me. So this time I had on Ramit Sethi's I Will Teach You To Be Rich podcast. And my nine-year-old nephew chimes in that rich people are greedy. I really wondered where he got that information from, but I knew I wanted to provide him with different thoughts and a different way of thinking about money and people, especially at his age. So many people have these invisible money scripts and things that they were told growing up that stick with them subconsciously, and it prevents them from truly being successful, like thinking that rich people are greedy or that you have to hustle and work yourself to the bone to make money. I am Shanice Miller, and welcome to my podcast, Do Less. Yes, that's right, Do Less. It used to be cool to work 60 hours a week, but the world has gotten smarter and realized why spend more time to make the same or less money. I help small business owners build systems and processes to help them scale and find more time for themselves and their families. I'm going to provide you the best practices and all the tools and tips to scale your business. Welcome to my show. I believe that by doing less, you can have peace and profits. And that's why I wanted to bring Kendra on the show today, because I know she believes that you can have peace and profits as well. So Kendra, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So can you tell me about a time where you didn't think you could have peace and profits? Uh, yeah. When I first started the business, when I first started really? my business. Yes. I, I I mean, I thought that that was something that was going to be attainable relatively easy. So that was always like a goal. But I realized very early on that like in the very start of a business, it's hard to have both because at least for me, I was in a constant grind mode and trying to, you know, obviously build up a team and build up the client roster and all of that. And so it was very much heavy on the profit side at that point. Mm -hmm. It was all about revenue goals and everything. And and I mean, I have a finance background, right? Like I work, it, I work in corporate finance. So I understood, you know, that what a PL and l needs to look like and how much money you have to make in a business to be profitable. And I just assumed that working for yourself was going to be peaceful. I thought that was the piece. Like having my own hours and being able to say I'm my own boss. But I realized early on that having your own hours and being your own boss and making your own money means sometimes 40, 50, 60 hour weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so in the very beginning, while I wanted peace and profits, I definitely wasn't having the peace part so much in those earlier, you know, those first couple of years, which is why now like my goal is for everyone, but especially women owned businesses, that's, that's where we really thrive, but for everyone to have a business that is both peaceful and profitable. How did it feel early on to not have that peace, even though you were profitable? Yeah, it was, I would say it was stressful, but it was also, there was a little fun to it, you know, cause you're working for yourself still and you're trying to figure things out. And I kind of enjoy that kind of work of figuring out like what's working and what's not working. But at the same time, it's tough because you're having to shift, at least I had to shift uh, my lifestyle right? Like I'm coming from making very good money in corporate and working very little hours when I was in corporate. Like they thought I was working a full-time job, but I was like checking in, you know, a couple of hours every once in a while, you know, able to kind of get things done because I had processes in place for my corporate job that they just didn't really know about. So I was coming from a very peaceful and high salary position to a business that was making money, but not so peaceful. So there was a little bit of that feeling of like failure and like, wait a second, question, like doubt. Is this really the smart thing to do? But at that time I was, you know, still relatively young. I was what, I guess in my like early thirties or something like that, maybe late twenties. And I had, didn't have my, my son yet, you know, wasn't married yet. So I had more time to do all of the grind work, which good and bad because I shouldn't have grinded so hard. I mean, it was hard. Um, mm -hmm. But but I, I at least had a little bit more time to do so. But it was definitely difficult and there was definitely a lot of doubt that set in. 
So what made you decide to switch since you had this nice cushiony job and it was paying you well and you actually weren't stressed out? Because, you know, a lot of times it's like, oh, I'm stressed out. That's why I want to leave work or like this boss is getting on my nerves. So what made you decide to switch over from that cushy job? Because that's the hardest part. Yeah, it's wild because everything you mentioned, I, I did not have. Like, I loved my boss. Like, he was like the great, like, we were just, it was, it was, it was a blast, honestly. And so um, I feel like God was pushing me because I would have stayed forever, like, in that environment. But the craziest thing happened. I moved to Dallas, went shopping downtown, which I never do. Like, I'm not a, a downtown city girl. So I went downtown, went shopping, walked into a boutique. The boutique owner just strikes up conversation, you know, she's like, hey, what do you do? And I mentioned, you know, hey, I work in finance. And she's like, oh, well, maybe one day you can help me like with my finances because the business is doing great. But like, I need some some more assistance. And I'm like, sure, anytime I'll help you. And so I'm like, just put me in contact with your accountant. I'll look things over, you know, give you some thoughts. She's like, accountant? I don't. I don't have an accountant. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? It's just me. Like, I'm running this whole business. I'm like, you're you have a brick and mortar business. At that time, I knew she was making multi millions in the business. So I'm like, you're making all of this money. You're working all these hours. You don't have anybody looking at your numbers. And she's like, no, that's why I'm asking you. Can you help me? So, long story short, fast forward about 30, 60 days later, after working with her, we were able to turn her business around completely, give her insight into her financials. And I realized that that was like, I was able to leverage the experience that I learned in corporate to actually make a big difference for someone. Mm-hmm. In corporate, I mean, I was working at GE. So they if I wasn't there in that in that office working, they were still going to make multi-billions of dollars. They were not going to miss Kendra in the office. They didn't know I wasn't in the office at the time, right? <laughs> but with her, it was making a huge difference in her business, in her life, in her team, and her other employees and their lives. So when I saw that, it was a no-brainer to leave corporate and to do this for businesses full-time. And I, I probably did it as a side hustle for about six months before I left corporate. But, but when I saw that impact, I was like, oh, no, for sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave and do this. Mm. So were you keeping up with that same kind of like marketing way that you were doing things, just going into the boutique owners stores and getting the word out? Like how over those six months were you deciding that it's like, cause a lot of times, you know, we hear about the overnight success, but yeah. it's really like, it's been a lot of time and journey and learning process. And like, it just sounds like you just, you jumped on in and it was just like, oh, I got a first client immediately where yeah. so many people struggle with that. Yeah. Well, I, well, the funny thing is when I went in, I had no intention on entrepreneurship. Right. So I think <laughs> when I was working with her on, kind of on the side to help her with some things and then she told a friend and they told a friend and maybe mm-hmm. within a few months, there were like a few clients there. And, and that's when I realized that there could be a business out of it. And so there really wasn't any like marketing or anything like that initially. Then when I quit, that's when I had more time. So, and that's actually kind of perfect timing because it was relatively, it was when Instagram was like becoming a thing. It was already there, but it was like becoming a thing. And so um, I was able to leverage to leverage social media and that definitely helped move things along a lot faster as well. And, but for the most part, it was, you know, either word of mouth from current clients or it was you know, social media. Okay. So now I'm curious about how you kind of got involved. What did you hear growing up about working and money and profits? Um, good question. So my both of my parents, my mom and my dad were corporate climbers. My mom is an accountant. My dad was an engineer. Mm-hmm. So you and- have the accounting in your background already for finance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, although my mom is like not your typical accountant. My mom is like a hippie accountant, which is like oxymoron, right? So she uh, she's definitely an accountant, but she's very much like free. So she's like, you know, live life how you want to live. Be happy. Money is no, is no worries, which is not like a typical accountant, right? <laughs> and my dad, he's an engineer, so he's very like structured and um, everything's very strategic. And so I definitely am both of their, like, I'm a product of both of them for sure. But as far as growing up and with money, it was never, money was never really a topic that we talked about a lot. It was more so shown, if that makes sense. So like I, my relationship with money was seeing my dad and we would go out to eat with like our family, even like our extended family and him just saying, oh, I'll pick up the tab. And seeing how everyone was just like, oh, okay. And it just like lightened 
kind of the mood. So it was more so that kind of thing, like make money to have experiences, make money to be able to live a good life. It was more about that than like, than anything else, if that, if that kind of makes sense. It does. It does. So then how did that, like seeing those things growing up, how did that shape you as you got older? Yeah, I, I can say that I, that money was never really anything that I struggled with as far as having those money. What's the word I'm looking for? Having those money blocks of, you know, oh my God, I'm not going to make enough money to be happy. Because if I'm making a hundred thousand dollars or if I'm making $10,000, I'll be able to be fine. Like I'll be able to make it, you know? But I will say that it kind of goes in line with the peace and profits because for me, it's about balancing the money with what what's also going to make you happy and understanding like it's not just the money, right? You can make multi-million dollars in your business, even in profit in your business. But if you don't know how you're wanting to live out your life, what kind of experiences you're wanting to have, then the money doesn't really matter. So it's understanding both of those things. A lot of times I've run into business owners who are making a ton of money, but they're either working way too hard in their business or they are like outsourcing a lot of the work and they're like, well, what's next? Like it's not fulfilling to them anymore. So that's why you have to have the balance of both. Like it's not just a money, a money thing, you know, contrary to what we see on Instagram and everything all the time, right? It's not just a money thing. Yeah, I completely agree with that because I was, you know, doing a different business before this and it just was not fulfilling, Uh, but I was doing everything. So I probably should have just allocated some money for other people to do it. But I hear that time and time again, like, you know, people get burnt out and it's not necessarily you're getting burnt out from too much work, but it's getting burnt out because you're not doing something that really lights you up. You're not delegating certain areas. You're not really doing less in your business so that you can really shift your focus to a passion or something that you really like to do. So you also talked about like creating the life, having like a goal and a vision in mind for what to do with the money. What is your vision and your goal? Because that is definitely something I really liked, especially how Vermeet talks about that. Like, what is your vision of your rich life? So what is yours? Yeah, Yeah, really? I just want to, to ensure that I'm set, that my child is set, that his children will be set, that their children will be set. So for me, it's about time. Like, I feel like the biggest blessing is being able to have options with your time. If you, when you wake up in the morning, you can decide what you want to do, who you want to spend it with, where you want to go. You don't have to go into this nine to five. You don't have to go over here and do this. You don't have to do that. And in order to do that, in order to have that time flexibility, you have to have obviously the financial resources to do that. And not about money in the bank to go and do all of these lavish things. Although if you want to do that and you want to do it occasionally, sure, make sure you have the resources to do that. But really more so about having that that money in the bank so that you can have the freedom to spend your time however you want to spend your time. And so for me, it's ultimately about time freedom for myself, for, for my children, for their children. And so it's not with that. It means not just having a certain amount of money in the bank, but having a certain mindset around money as well so that they, myself and they are able to understand, you know, how to make more of it, how to spend what they have responsibly. So it's, it's a combination of those two things. Okay. Well, I wanted you to kind of tell me a little bit more about, you said getting and setting your son up and his son up for success. What does that mean? It it means that money mindset. So it means understanding like whether, whether you are left with $1 million, $2 million and $100, you should be able to understand how to leverage that to get to whatever it is that you're wanting to get to not just a money goal, but a life goal. So it's about, you know, Carter, my son, he's two now. So there's not much lessons I can give him right now, but I already have my little notebook on all the different things I'm going to talk to him about as he gets older. But, you know, whether it's implementing an allowance system, right, to learn to teach him how, you know, you take out the trash, you earn a dollar or whatever, so that he can understand that that relationship with money or, you know, save up your money so that for the summertime you can go and do X, Y, and Z. So it's, it's ingraining that information into him and to his, you know, future family so that regardless of what they choose to do in life, they know how to actually leverage what's coming, the resources that are coming their way. Okay. I like how you said that too, because I've always said like managing money, it's not necessarily how much you bring in, but how well you're managing it, what you're doing with that money. I think you get a little bit extreme though, because I'm in my mind, I'm like, okay, I can see managing a million, a hundred thousand. How are you going to manage a hundred dollars? 
hundred dollars. There's a lot you can do with a hundred dollars. I know a couple of business owners who have multi million dollars who started off with this five hundred dollar, you know, five hundred dollar in like a couch, right? And it's like, how did you flip that? But, but you know, it's it's creativity, right? It's using it's using your mind to be creative. It's using your mind to assess the marketplace and see where the need is. You know, um, it might mean you have a hundred dollars cash. And maybe you need to figure out a really good plan so that you can go to a bank and get a fifty thousand dollar loan. Because you have good credit, because you have good money mindset, so you knew to have good credit. So it's of course it's like to your point, the hundred dollars might be it might take a, some other avenues to be able to get to a, a million dollars. But if you had the right money mindset growing up, then you ensured that you had you know proper credit and all of those different things in place, so that if you need to leverage someone else's money, you can do that. Okay. I definitely see where you you're going with that. I was thinking so literal of <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, that a hundred dollars you can't squeeze too much out of because <laughs> you know, people are like, I'll be happy with whatever. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know if I kinda go with that philosophy about being with, happy with whatever because you know, at the end of the day, we do have these fixed costs. You know, you have your right. mortgage, you have, you know, certain bills that you need to survive. So it's like okay, I can have, you do need profits, like you said before, in order to have some of that piece too. But then there's that balance of like, okay, well, how much profits is enough? And, you know, to me, I'm like a hundred dollar profit is not enough <laughs> at all. The thing to, to keep in mind is the other most valuable resource, right? Which is time. And so I think mm-hmm. sometimes we undervalue our ability to, now bartering is, I want to be very, 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 very clear <laughs> when I say like barter, right? You have to know the value of the barter. Right. Like, so if you are someone who's excellent at marketing and you're wanting to barter services with someone who's excellent, who's a lawyer, who can write up contracts. Right. You have to know what's a fair trade for things like that. But sometimes it just takes getting scrappy. And I think that, you know, that's that's kind of, you know, another little lesson for like the, the hundred dollar idea or whatever. Right. It's like it might take being a little bit more scrappy, but sometimes those are the best business owners, because if I hand you a million dollars, you're, you're a lot more set and you don't have to have as much business savvy than if I handed you a hundred dollars and told you to make money, right? Exactly. It's those who get a hundred, they're a lot more scrappy. And a lot of times they can uh, face adversity of lower, you know, lower sales months and things like that than somebody who's handed a million dollars and runs it in the ground in the first year. <laughs> that is, those are true, really true, accurate points. So what are you going to do with all of this free time that you have now? And will you ever shift to being more profit focused again? That's a good question. Well, I'm actually, I'm still very profit focused. So I would say that peace and profit is definitely equally split there. It's about both of them for sure, because, you know, I can't, I can only scale so much without, without the profits too. But that's actually the biggest thing on my plate right now is figuring out like what's next. I think the, the accounting firm, like that's, that's going and running really well. The fractional CFO firm, like that's going and running really well. So I think now it's a matter of figuring out if I even want to do more right now. And I think that's one of those struggles with that I see with other entrepreneurs, especially women as well, where it's like you accomplish and then you're like, okay, what's next? What else? What do I have to do next? You can just sit down. It's okay. <laughs> like you can just sit down for a little bit, you know, and just enjoy, you know, and we're, so my wife and I were planning on um, going through IVF again, going for baby number two in this fall. So that's why right now. I'm just like, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that requires you to sit down. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Maybe this is actually good timing. And I just need to just kind of sit down, take some breaths now before, you know, potentially, hopefully, prayerfully being a mom of two. And, you know, like, so right now, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm in the season of. And then, you know, hopefully when that baby comes, I can be in that season for a little while as well. And so I think that's, again, the benefit of that peace and profits, understanding both of them is time freedom. And so now having that time freedom, I know that if I wanted to go and do something else, I could. But right now, I think I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> I think I'm just going to sit down. Okay. Well, what systems do you have in place that allows you to have so much time? Whew. I mean, where do we start, right? I think the biggest thing, no, I know the biggest thing for me, for sure, is my team. The actual people on my team is the biggest system. Like they are amazing. And that is, you know, it takes trial and error to get an amazing team. I was actually just talking to a coach student the other day who was like, Kendra, you didn't tell me it was so hard to find people. I'm like, I told you. 
it was hard. This is this is a hard thing to do, you know. And I have a lot of people who tell me that same thing, and I'm like, yeah, it's that process of filtering. But there is a system that we set up so that it's just like, okay, we are making sure that we have all of your applications. You're asking all the right questions. You have the goal in mind. It's part of our 90 day action plan to really sit there and say like. What do you need to hire this person for? What are the exact duties you need to do? Because that's where I see people kind of getting lost right. with hiring. Is like you have this idea, this one person's going to come in and take off all the duties that you were doing. And it's like, right. no. And they that person also needs training. They need help to know exactly what it is you want them to do step by step so that when you do find that great, perfect match, you know exactly and they know exactly what it is that they need to do, what they're being hired for day by day, you know, what are their lists so that they're not just twirling their thumbs and wasting your money on the clock, but they actually I always tell folks that the that the the onboarding of your new hire is going to make or break that new hire. So yes. you can't throw somebody in the mess and and not let them know what, what their you know low hanging fruit are, what their big goals are. But I think so ultimately, I mean it's just a shift in never having been the person who's always getting hired to shifting to then doing the hiring. You know, mm. there's a shift there that has to get made um, mentally with some business owners. That's, you know, just a little bit harder for them to do. But for sure, for us, the number one thing is our team. And then we have systems for everything else, for our client work. Obviously, we're an accounting and fractional CFO firm. So for accounting work and analysis and all of that. But the biggest hack is the team. Okay. Sure. So then how do you make that shift over from, you know, being hired to hiring a team? Uh, so that very first client I was telling you about, the boutique owner, as soon as that contract was signed with her, I hired my first person, which I know is insane. I would not suggest it. <laughs> I was <laughs> why um, not? Um, because it was a it was a big risk. Like, what if that client didn't work out? And here I am bringing somebody on the team immediately. But the reason why I did that was because my background and experience is finance. What she needed first was accounting. I'm like, you don't even have any accounting in place. Now, of course, I can do accounting, but that's not my area of expertise. And I don't do like, I don't tap dance in areas that I'm not an expert in. I think too many people do that and it gets folks in trouble. And accounting is not one of those areas you want to do that. So I brought her on board to handle the accounting for all the clients so I can serve on the, on the CFO side. So very early on, I had to put that hat on. And, and I, I had hired in corporate for my team, but it was still different hiring for my business, right? Because I'm like, this isn't like, if you'd mess up, that was GE's money. If you mess up with me, this is my money. Like, wait a second, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it, it, it took a little bit of a little bit of work, but I will say my very first hire that I hired back then, she's still with me today. She's my accounting director. That's amazing. So, and yeah. I think that was really like wonderful for you to see that and to realize like so many people I see are trying to grab all the money. So they're like trying to do it all themselves. They're not wanting to or ready to hire anyone to help them with the client work. They're trying to do all the marketing themselves. They're trying to, you know, just pulling from every stream. They're trying to tell everyone that they're a perfect fit for their offer as well. And I'm like, no, that's not true. Right. <laughs> you know, work with the people that really are going to what you can really help them with and everyone, you know, trying to grab it all from all these different venues, avenues, different businesses as well. If that's not what you're doing, it just burns you into the ground so quickly. Absolutely. So I was really glad to hear that you were just like, Oh, as soon as I knew she needed that, I hired someone to do that job. Even though I didn't know if I was going to get another contract, did you hire her as like an employee or was she a con subcontractor? So initially she was a contractor. Okay. Initially she was a contractor. And I think that goes back to the point of how I was raised in my, in my money mindset, not having that scarcity mindset around money and being, and also still having my full-time job and understanding like even, even if 100% of the money that I made from that client went to that contractor to get the work done, I knew that was just the start. Now, of course that wasn't the case. 100% did not go to that. <laughs> but even if it did, if that's what it took, I would have done that because I didn't need the money. I had my corporate job and I, I saw the longer vision and the longer vision was, okay, let me get her on board so that she can understand how this client works so that we can then duplicate this and triplicate this. And then it can become a larger thing. And I think that if, if, if any of your listeners are currently working a job while they're building their business, then have, you know, adopt that mindset and leverage, live off of your salary and let your business scale your business. 
You know, don't too quickly pull too much money out of your business for personal things. Let your business scale itself using its fun, using its funds and the revenue from that. And if you're already out of corporate and you're in your business full time, then the first thing that you want to do is let go of, all, in my opinion, is let go of all of the things that are not revenue generating and figure out how to outsource that, whether it's to a contractor or, you know, to even if you had enough work for a part timer. But you, you can't do, you can't have your hands in all of the things. Like you're going to stunt your business from growing for sure. And you're going to burn out. <laughs> I, yes, I absolutely love that. I love the fact that you mentioned that. And we have a lot of similarities because when I first started off, I was definitely like the business money was the business money. The job that I had, that was money for everything else until the business started growing and I transitioned out. So it is like still being able to have the peace with the profits from having the money still a stable income from somewhere else, then transitioning out once you know you have your workflow set, you have your systems in place, not just jumping in without a plan or like a I, an idea of like, how am I going to go about this wisely so that I'm not putting myself in this really bad position. So thank you yeah. so much for coming on, Kendra, and sharing your story. It was such a pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was fun. So this has been an amazing episode of Do Less with me, Shanice Miller. Share this episode with anyone who needs to hear this today. Leave a five-star rating and review. And remember, if you're a business owner and you need to do less in your business, click the link in the description to work with me.